Hello? Oh, so, interesting. Uh, bring all the people in. <laughs> <laughs> talk about networks, yeah. I see. see. Yeah. So, uh, some of the faculty doesn't like deep learning, so I said, okay, I'll bring everybody in. <laughs> <laughs> So they are um, uh, now they like more <laughs> after, after hearing <laughs> these different nets. <laughs> Thank you, Jimbo. Um, I'm very glad to be here. And today I'd like to share you uh, my lab's recent work that tries to teach computers to see more and think better. We can probably all agree that we would like to have machines that can see and think. Uh, in fact, we have been imagining such machines for a long time. Uh, let me show you an example. This is a magazine for kids from the 80s. And inside this magazine, it was telling kids what computers are and what they can do, and in particular, how smart uh, computers are. Uh, so he says that computers are being taught to see, hear, touch, smell, and move. They are also being taught to think, learn, and be creative. Here you can see that it identifies two sets of things that would like a smart machine to do. Uh, one set of things is about uh, the interface with the real world, uh, like seeing. And the other set of things relates to what goes on internally to produce adaptive behavior. Uh, so that's why I am um, fascinated by uh, seeing and thinking. Um, inside this magazine, it goes on to say that although computers are being taught to do these things, uh, they are not very good yet. 
Uh, in particular, they're at the level of a bug, a spider, or a gnat. Um, so now, 30 years later, um, we can ask the question, how smart are computers today? Let's start with the ability to see. Uh, we all know that object recognition has been a great success. Computers are pretty good at recognizing objects. However, we also know that there's not much else that computers can reliably tell us from an input image. Uh, so there are a lot of things that are missing compared to what humans perceive. Today, I'd like to focus on one aspect uh, that I think is important, but is missing. That is the relationships between objects. For example, this droid is looking at this monitor. And this monitor is actually on a console. Right? These are the relationships you can have between objects. At this point, you might say, well, here is a monitor and a console. Obviously, the monitor is on the console. Where else can it be? But consider this example. There is one person and two bikes. What do you think is going on? Well, you probably can guess that the person is riding a bike. Yes, you're correct. But also, there is a bike riding a person. <laughs> so if you ignore relationships, you're going to miss a lot of interesting stuff. At this point, you might also say, well, uh, we know that computers can actually generate captions from images. For example, this is one of the well-known systems. It's called NeuroTalk by Kapathy and Feifei. It can take an input image and produce an output like this. A man riding a bike down the street. Since it gives full sentences, it has uh, verbs and prepositions, which actually tell you about relationships between objects. Yes, indeed, you can get relationships from the captions. And this is a very imperfect system. But the system does have some limitations. Uh, one uh, of them is that it seems that it tends to say the same relationship given the same set of objects. For example, in these two images, the person is actually not writing a bag, but the system says writing a bag nonetheless. And here's another example. Uh, the system gets all the objects correct, but the number of relationships. So it does show that the, the understanding of relationships is limited. Uh, the same issue shows up for Google Image Search as well. For example, this is a query you can try. Uh, the top results contain all the objects you want, but the relationship isn't really correct. Right? None of the persons is actually walking a bike. So this suggests to us that it's time to move beyond object recognition to extracting not only objects, but also relationships. Uh, so in fact, today I'd like to address this more general problem uh, that I call pixels to spatially grounded graphs. Okay? So in this case, objects and relationships are just a special case of uh, generating a graph where the nodes of the graph represent objects and the edges represent relationships. And each of the objects is grounded in the image as a bounding box. So why do I want to address this more general problem? Uh, this is because Graphs can be used to represent the output of many uh, computer vision tasks. For example, in human pose, we'd like to output a pose graph for each of the persons. And for segmentation, we may like to output a hierarchy of segments where the nodes would represent the segments and the edges of the graph would represent composition relationships. Also in tracking, where we'd like to have a set of trajectories for each of the objects. Here, the nodes will represent the detections in each individual frame, uh, and the edges will represent temporal correspondences. Also, graphs serve as a bridge to language and thought. They are used to represent the semantics of natural sentences, the semantics of programming languages, as well as semantic knowledge in general. And today, I'd like to show you a unified method we recently developed for the problem of pixels to graphs. But before tackling the full general problem, I'd like to take a simpler step first. That is, I'd like to address this spatial grounding problem given a known graph. So one example of this is single person pose estimation. So here, by spatial grounding, I mean assign a 2D location. Uh, and the known graph is the human skeleton, for which we have a predefined set of body joints. So in the input image, we assume that there is a single person in the center and scaled. And the output is 2D locations for each of the body joints. 
So this is a long-standing problem in computer vision with the long history of the research. And the classical approach to this problem to use a graphical model that has a set of local discrete variables, each representing the location of a body joint. Uh, in this graphical model, we can also have a global variable that represents the overall configuration of the human pose, for example, front-facing versus back-facing. And to do inference, we pass messages between these variables, and these messages could also depend on the features we extract from the input image, like some local features and some global features. We know that deep learning has revolutionized computer vision, and one of the insights from deep learning is that we can take an existing function and make a more general version out of it, that approximate the computation of the original function. Uh, and this more general function has a lot more learnable parameters. And this turns out to be very effective. You have a lot of uh, training data. And one of the lessons Alex Nett taught us is that we can replace conventional features like hog and sift with multiple layers of convolution and nonlinearity. Here, we can ask a similar question. Can we design a neural network to mimic computation that's done uh, in this classical approach. So this is what we came up with. Uh, we call it uh, Stacked Allgrass Network. It is a convolution neural network-based architecture that looks like this. Uh, the input is an RGB image, and the output is a set of heat maps, one for each body joint. You can think of these heat maps as belief maps or marginals uh, for the variables in, in the graphical model. And this Network consists of a sequence of so-called hourglass modules. Each hourglass module consists of a sequence of convolution and downsampling, followed by another sequence of convolution uh, and downsampling. And then you have these side branches with convolution as well. And so here, the convolution you do at high resolution mimics the computation of extracting local features and passing messages between local variables. Because message passing essentially is taking the vectors from your neighbors and update your own vector. And the downsampling and uh, convolution mimics the computation of extracting global features as well as passing messages from local variables to global variables. And this upsampling plus element-wise addition mimics the computation of passing messages from global variables to local variables. Uh, one thing to note is that there are other variants of uh, similar ideas. For example, this UNET uh, that differs uh, in some details. For example, it does concatenation instead of addition, and it use, uses identity skip connections. And our main contribution in this work is that we stack multiple such R glasses together. This would approximate loopy belief propagation. So you do multiple rounds of message passing between local variables and global variables. And here we do no weight sharing between our glasses to allow more flexibility. We show that by stacking more our glasses, we can in general get better results with the same number of parameters. So the improvement doesn't come from a bigger uh, network. And we can extract intermediate predictions uh, after each hourglass, and we can see how the network learns to gradually refine the estimates of human pose as it uses more hourglasses. We are not the only one that uh, came up with an uh, architecture with repetitive units for the problem of human pose. Uh, here is a partial list of related work. Um, so our design is unique in that we don't use re a recurrent unit, in that we don't share any weights. And also, our iterative unit is an hourglass, uh, unlike, uh, for example, the convolutional pose machines. And with a stacked hourglass network, we were able to advance the safety art on human pose estimation on two standard data sets. OK, now, having uh, shown you how to address this spatial grounding problem of a known graph. Let's actually turn to the problem of graph generation. But again, before tackling the full general problem, I'd like to start uh, with a uh, simpler problem that's a special case of a graph. That is, from pixels to spatially grounded clicks. Uh, one example of this is the multi-person pose estimation problem. 
So here, each click represents the body joints that belong to the same person. Here, we can no longer assume that there's a single person in the input image. There can be multiple people or zero people. And here, the output is a set of pose graphs, one for each person. Uh, because we don't know how many nodes there are in the graph in advance, also don't know how they're connected to each other, there is an actual problem of graph generation. Traditionally, there have been two kinds of approach to this problem. Uh, one is the, the top-down approach, where you first do person detection and you crop each detection for, uh, and do single person pose. Another approach is the button-up approach, where you first do the key point detection and then you extract pairwise features from the detected key points and then you run some grouping method to group the detected key points into individual people. <coughs> so here we ask the question whether we can avoid the decomposition of this uh, problem into multiple stages. Can we just do a single network, a single stage network that uh, does detection and grouping at the same time in one go? So, uh, so you don't have to worry about how do you decompose it into multiple stages and you don't need to design the interface between the different stages. This has the potential advantage of allowing the network to take uh, all the relevant factors into consideration when it tries to construct the final graph. Um, so uh, we uh, proposed this idea called associative embedding uh, for, for this task. And the idea is to use vector embeddings to encode grouping. Uh, this is how it works. We still use the exact same setup we have used for single person pose. So here we have the input image and we apply the stacked all glass network and it gives us a set of heat maps, uh, one for each body joint uh, as before. Because there are multiple people, uh, now we're going to get multiple detections. Right? So we do the usual thing that is uh, thresholding plus non maximum suppression. So for example, we can get two detections of the right wrist and two detections of the right elbow. Okay. Now, we have these four detections, but this is not the output we want because we don't know how the nodes are connected to each other. We don't know which elbow connects to which wrist. Right? So we need to figure that out. So here, we simply ask the same network to give us some additional output uh, in terms of vector embeddings. Here, we ask the network to output a vector embedding for each of the detections. For example, we have an embedding vector for uh, the, 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 the right wrist and both of the right wrist. We also have uh, two embedding vectors for both of the uh, right elbows. And these embedding vectors serve as identity tags that tell us how things should group together. So if, for example, this right wrist has the same embedding vector as this right elbow, so we know that uh, they should be connected. And this other wrist has the same embedding as this other elbow, so we know that uh, they should be connected together. And in uh, implementation, we actually output an embedding vector for each pixel. And during test time, we would do non micro suppression and thresholding on the detection heat map to get the detection to the locations. And then we look up the embedding vectors from the corresponding locations. Just final, just the, the, the very last uh, feature, uh, uh, output of the network. And obviously, you can do intermediate supervision, as, uh, so you can decode such embeddings. So what's like the learning objective? To yeah, that's a great question. That's the next slide. Um, so here, how do you do training? How do you train a network to predict such embeddings? So here, we just impose a loss function that does pairwise comparisons of the embeddings. Uh, at the ground truth lo detection locations. So here note that we actually don't have a ground truth embeddings for the network to predict. Okay? So uh, the network is free to assign any absolute values. We don't care about absolute values. All we care about is that the network assigns similar embedding vectors for body joints that belong to the same person and different embedding vectors for body joints belonging to different people. Uh, that's all we need. So it, essentially it's a metric learning loss. And uh, it turns out that we can use just the uh, embedding vectors of one dimension, essentially a real number, uh, for the problem with uh, multi-person pose. It turns out that the network would learn to roughly use the horizontal location of the person as the embedding vector to identify each uh, individual. So here's an example. Uh, this, this is an input image, and there are eight people uh, in this image. 
and then the x-axis is the value of the embedding. That's just a real number. The y-axis here is the index, index of the key points, different key points. As you can see, that uh, you can see that the, each person gets uh, roughly the same real number. Okay, and you can see that um, once you have such uh, embedding outputs, a decoding uh, graph is actually trivial, right? So the network has already done the hard work. So uh, you can just use a simple greedy uh, method to get uh, to put the things together. Okay, that's what we actually do. That doesn't involve any sophisticated uh, discrete optimization. We simply use a greedy procedure to, to uh, put the body joints together into different people. And with uh, this method, we uh, evaluated uh, on multi, uh, MPI, multi-person pose, as well as MS COCO, uh, two very standard data sets. And we uh, advanced CVR results on multi-person post estimation, we uh, outperformed all the prior methods, including mask ASEAN. And uh, I'd like to note that this uh, idea of associated embedding actually is more general than uh, human post estimation. It can, you can uh, use it to uh, do other problems that involve joint detection and grouping. For example, you can use it to solve instant segmentation. Right? So here the detection is about the foreground pixels. You ask network to produce a uh, segmentation mask uh, that labels every pixel as person versus non-person, and then you have an embedding map that tells you how the foreground pixels should group to individual instances. Okay. Now, yes. The last function is both the join and also the pairwise uh, Right. So for the for the case of segmentation. And in the case of segmentation, one detail is that you actually do not need to do every pair comparison. You can just do a sparse sample of uh, pairs, and that turns out to be sufficient. Okay, so um, now um, I have shown how to generate spatially grounded clicks, but this is still not a full general graph. Now I'm going to turn to the full general problem, that is from pixels to spatially grounded arbitrary graph. This, in this case, an arbitrary graph means an arbitrary directed graph. And let's come back to the example that motivated us earlier. That is the problem of seeing graph predictions. So here we have an input image. We'd like to uh, predict a graph where the nodes represent the objects and the edges represent the relationships. Here it turns out that we can use the same idea to do this task, except that we need to rethink how we use the associative embeddings. So here we have this input image. Uh, we still apply a second hourglass network. And this network gives us a detection map about the objects, but all objects detected. So for example, here, after doing thresholding on non-maximum suppression, we detect four objects. And this network also outputs a feature map of the same resolution. And we go through each of the detections, and then we extract the feature vector at the corresponding location of this feature map. So we get a feature vector for each detection. And then we pass this feature vector to a decoder. Uh, this decoder, in this case, is just a simple fully connected layer. And we decode a set of properties we care about. Here, we decode the class label of the object. For example, here we know that this is a dog. And we also decode the bounding box, so we know where the object is. And we have an embedding vector for this object. Okay. This embedding vector serves as an identity tag, again. And we do this for other objects as well. So for example, this is the other, another object that is a frisbee. It has a bounding box. It also has an embedding vector. And note that the embedding vector we have for the frisbee is different from the embedding vector we have for the dog. In fact, this network outputs uh, also a detection map of relations. Okay? So here, we treat each relation as something to be detected as well. So each relation, you can assume that it lives at a particular spatial location, for example, the midpoint between the two objects. And so here, we detect three, locations, three relationships. And we do the same thing to these detected relationships. We're going to extract the feature vector at the detected location and then pass it through a decoder. And so here, we detect a set of properties we care about uh, a relationship. So here we have the class label relationship. For example, this relationship is about catching. Right? And then we also have two embedding vectors, a source embedding vector and destination embedding vector. The source embedding vector turns out to be the same 
as an embedding vector we give to the dog object. Okay? So this source embedding vector tells us that dog is the first participant in this relationship. So it tells us dog is the object that does the catching. And the destination uh, embedding tells us that uh, the frisbee is the object being caught. Right? So it, it, the embedding vector matches the embedding vector assigned to the frisbee object. And again, okay. yes? Actually, of course, that's the next slide. <laughs> so here, as you say, once you have these embedding vectors, now uh, you can construct a graph, right, by just matching these embedding vectors through some greedy procedure. Now, uh, the essential idea is, th is to represent the graph as a list of nodes, each with an address, and a list of edges, each with two pointers. Right? So the pointers point to uh, the nodes that an edge connects. And in training, we have a loss function that says the network has to assign different addresses for different nodes. Right? The addresses have to be all distinct from each other. And then the pointers have to be similar to whatever they are pointing to. Right? So we have essentially, again, the metric loss that pushes some embeddings uh, apart and some embeddings pull some embeddings together. Okay? With uh, this uh, approach, we... Uh, uh, we can, we can uh, do this uh, graph generation task on the data set called the visual genome, which has a large number of images annotated with ground truth scene graphs so that we can do supervised learning. And we show that we can outperform prior results by a very large margin in different settings from the most difficult to the, to the easiest. Uh, the easiest setting would assume that you, you are given the ground truth object detections and the only task is about classifying relations. And the most difficult setting is uh, predict the graph just from the pixels. In all these settings, we can achieve large improvements. So the key ingredients for this general pixel-to-graph approach uh, are, number one, a stack of grass network uh, that allows you to do inference at multiple scales and aggregate information at multiple scales. And then, uh, number two, associative embeddings that allow you to encode the graph as a tensor in, the, it, in other words, in the continuous form. Uh, once you are able to encode the graph in the continuous form, you are able to do end-to-end -end training. Okay, so uh, now I've shown you all the ingredients for this general method for pixels to graphs. Um, but uh, I actually, I can, I, I'd like to tell you that I, I uh, have cut some corners uh, in, in this approach, and in particular, uh, by 2D grounding, I actually, uh, by spatial grounding, I only meant 2D spatial grounding. Uh, but in fact, uh, 2D spatial grounding is often not good enough. For example, consider this well-known uh, case. Uh, it's here you have two figures. If you do multi-person pose estimation, you're going to get two poses that are exactly the same. And you're not going to get the story that a big monster is chasing a small monster. So here, we'd like to lift our 2D grounding into 3D. And the most general way of doing this is to assign a depth value for each pixel. And this turns out to be just yet another image-to-image uh, -image problem, right? So in this case, the stacked Argos network or any other image-to-image -image architecture can still be used. Um, but there is a difficulty in getting the ground truth because to train this network, you actually need ground truth depths uh, to, uh, to supervise the network. But this is, ground truth is actually very difficult to get. For example, uh, one way to do it is to use a depth sensor, like Kinect or LiDAR. But uh, collecting data using Kinect sensors uh, is very tedious because you have to carry it around while you are taking the photo. And also, they don't always work. They have a limitation on the range it can cover. And also, they fail on transparent or specular objects. As a result, the data sets we have on RGBD data uh, are limited to specific types of things, for example, rooms with no people uh, or uh, driving things. If you train a network on such data, you can get reasonable results if the input is the same type of thing. But if you give it a random image, it tends to make a lot of mistakes. For example, this is an arbitrary image, and uh, the network thinks that uh, the sky is actually closer to uh, the building in the center. Why? It's because it, it's, it has only seen rooms, right? It assumes that the sky is actually the ceiling. Uh, here's another example. This is an indoor example. Again, so the network makes a mistake thinking that 
the wall, the wall in the background is actually closer than some parts of the cat. Right? This is also a result of uh, overcommitment to uh, some priors. What we'd like to do is to make depth estimation work for images in the wild, arbitrary images, uh, those you would typically want to do object detection on, for example. Uh, so here, our idea is to use the human visual system to generate supervision. So we can take an image, we can ask humans with the depth they perceive, and then use such perception to train our network. Now, the advantage of this approach is that now you have the entire internet at your disposal. Right? You don't have to uh, be constrained to particular types of images, and you can do it after the fact. Well, uh, obviously there's no free lunch. Uh, the problem is that you cannot really ask humans about the depth value, metric depth, at each individual pixel. You cannot really ask, okay, what's the depth of this pixel in meters? Humans cannot do this very well. Um, so instead, we asked about some alternative forms of uh, annotations. So for example, we uh, ask about relative depths, so given two points, sampled uh, from an input image, we ask humans which point is closer. This uh, is inspired by an earlier work called Intrinsic Image in the Wild, uh, which crowdsourced relative reflectance. So we collect a data set called Depths in the Wild that consists of half a million random images from Flickr with one pair of points uh, annotated for each image. So now with annotations of relative depths, you can ask how do we use them to train a network, how do we use them to actually do depth estimation uh, for each pixel. So there was uh, this excellent prior work from MIT uh, that involves multiple steps. So it takes an input image and it extracts super pixels and it's trained a ComNet to classify the relationship, the, the, the depth ordering for each pair of super pixels uh, and then do a global optimization to assign a depth value for each of the pixels. So here, we take a much simpler approach, uh, which also turns out to be more effective. So here the idea is that we just use a stack at Algras network and it predicts per pixel depth. Okay, so the, the prediction is just direct per pixel depth. And here we just have a loss function that says the depth map you predict has to be consistent with the ground truth orderings we have. Right, so this turns out to be a ranking loss imposed on the predicted depth map. And we uh, can extend this idea to other forms of annotations, such as surface normals. So here uh, we can have a UI that asks a human uh, on the perceived surface orientation at uh, a particular point. Uh, it turns out the humans can actually give you a consistent estimate of the surface orientation. And similarly, we're going to use the same training method. We ask the network to predict a dense map of depth. And then we derive surface normals from the predicted depth map. And then we compare this derived surface normal with a human annotated surface normal. Because the derivation from depth to surface normal is differentiable, so we can do full end-to-end -end training. So we can show that with the human annotated depth, uh, we can improve the depth estimation results for images in the wild. Here are a few examples. So the overall idea is to get uh, human annotated 3D and use them to uh, complement existing RGBD data. And this uh, has the potential to make a depth estimation truly work for arbitrary images. Okay. Now I'm showing you uh, all the ingredients uh, for this method for pixels to graphs. Now let's switch to the thinking part of, of this talk. So the reason um, I am interested in thinking is, is that uh, just having a vision module is not enough for building an intelligent system. Right? Here's, uh, let's consider an example, right? We have this vision module that's, uh, you know, we have, can have an input image and I can ask you, what is this? Right? If you take an off-the-shelf image classifier or detector, uh, this is probably the answer you can get, a building. Right? But what if I ask, what building? Now this off-the-shelf classifier cannot answer, likely cannot answer. I don't know how many of you uh, know what this building is. Uh, this is the Baxter building at the University of Michigan, which uh, uh, houses the computer science department. And um, so um, for the vision engine to be able to answer this question, it needs an external knowledge base that stores uh, such local and specialized knowledge. 
But even with the knowledge base, it might not be sufficient because I can follow up with yet another question. Is Baxter the tallest building on campus? Right now, to this answer question, to answer this question, you actually need some thinking. You need to think about, okay, what are the buildings on campus and what's their relative height? So you need a reasoning engine uh, in conjunction of a vision module and the knowledge base. So this triangle uh, can pose a lot of interesting questions, right? Because there are a lot of interactions between these three modules. We have done some work uh, on the interaction between the vision module and the knowledge base. Uh, so for example, the classification problem uh, is in fact in generally, is, is in fact in general a multi-label classification problem, right? Because you can classify an image with multiple labels. For example, in this case, it's a building. It's not a skyscraper. Uh, it's, it's not a dog. And uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's something man-made, right? So you can have a large uh, vocabulary of multiple labels. Now, we know that these labels, labels are actually not independent, right? So they actually have some constraints between them. For example, we know that you know, if something is a building, it must be man-made. And also, we know that if it's man-made, it cannot be a dog. Okay, so uh, man-made and dog, they are uh, mutually exclusive. So we can have a knowledge base uh, encode uh, a set of logical constraints we have about these labels. So now the question is, can we do classification, in particular multi-label classification, in a way that's consistent with uh, such knowledge about the constraints uh, between labels? In particular, we'd like to assign probabilities to these labels such that they're actually consistent with, the, uh, with the, this prior knowledge you have. And um, it turns out uh, such knowledge actually can be expressed as a graph that involves hierarchical relationships, like you know, a skyscraper is a type of a building, and the building is a type of uh, man-made things. And uh, the, you know, there are exclusive relationships. You know, man-made things cannot be a dog. Right? So we can have uh, the knowledge expressed as a graph, and then we can ask the question, how we can take an input image and uh, uh, assign probabilities to these labels in a way that's consistent to uh, this knowledge graph. Uh, so this is a work uh, we did a few years ago, and we proposed a approach that combines graphical models as well as deep networks, such that the probabilities you get uh, from such a system are guaranteed uh, rigorously in the exact sense to be consistent with the knowledge uh, you have and today, actually, I'm not going into the details about this work. I, I just wanted to show you sort of the questions we can uh, ask uh, about uh, this triangle. And today, actually, I'm going to focus on uh, the interaction between a reasoning engine and a knowledge base, uh, which is uh, a recent work we did. So here, I'm going to uh, use this question as an example. Is Baxter the tallest building on campus? And I'm going to cheat a little bit by assuming that we actually have turned this question into its logical form, okay? Especially lots of first order logic. Uh, that is, you know, if it's a building if it's on campus, that means that it has a, a smaller height, right? And I, I can, we can assume that the knowledge base consists of a list of facts that's already known. These facts are also expressed in logical form. Uh, these facts can come from a variety of sources, for example, vision. Uh, for example, the relative height between buildings can come from vision. Uh, the knowledge can also come from other sources like text, but this uh, doesn't concern us for now. So now we are at this setting uh, with a question in logical form and the list of facts in logical form. And so this is the exact same setting as theorem proving or logical reasoning in general. So here we have a question that's a conjecture. We'd like to prove or disprove this conjecture. If we prove this conjecture, we'd like to generate a proof. So um, today I'd like to show you one piece towards uh, solving the theorem, problem, uh, theorem uh, proving problem, uh, that is premise selection. So here the task is to select facts relevant for proving a given conjecture. So a very simplistic setting is that you can take a conjecture and a fact, so two inputs, and you try to make a binary decision whether this fact is relevant for proving this conjecture or not. Uh, for example, we can apply primary selection to the knowledge base we have and decide that out of these five facts, only two of them are relevant, right? So the relative height between two buildings is relevant, and uh, the transitive rule of comparison uh, is relevant. So the reason we care about primary selection is that Theorem proving is essentially a search problem, right? You start with a set of facts that are known, and you try to 
combine these facts to generate new facts through logical rules, and then you construct a path to reach the conjecture you care about. So if you have a very large knowledge base, for example, an encyclopedia, and then your search space will explode, and then theorem proving will be intractable. What primary selection can do is to narrow down this large knowledge base into a single page cheat sheet, so your life becomes much easier. Okay, so here we'd like to take a learning-based approach. I would like to learn heuristics or intuition for primary selection. So this is a binary classification problem. Uh, we take a conjecture and a fact as input, and we arrive at a binary decision. Uh, in particular, we'd like to use a classifier. And to use a classifier, we know that the easiest is that we would like to convert our input into vectors or fixed dimension, right? Then we, can, we know how to do it. We can use our favorite classifier. So now the problem becomes, how do, you, how do we turn each logical statement into a vector of fixed dimension? Right? This, in other words, how do we embed a logical statement into a, a vector? We would like to do this for both conjecture and the fact. So you can probably uh, come up with uh, different ways uh, uh, to do this. Um, so here, uh, one observation we have about a good embedding method is that it should be invariant to how you name the variables because this is something particular about a logical statement, especially first order logic statement or higher order logic statement. You ha we have variables, right, with quantifiers. And we know for a fact that if we replace the names of these variables, the meaning of the logical statement doesn't change. Right? For example, here, if we replace x and y with s and t, it's still the same logical statement, express the same semantics. So this means that uh, a good embedding method should generate the exact same embedding, even after you've uh, changed the names of the variables. Okay? So now the question becomes, how do we come up with an embedding method that satisfies this property? Um, here's a solution we came up with. It involves uh, converting a logical statement into a graph and uh, embed this graph. So here's how it works. So we have this logical statement, and we're going to generate uh, a tree uh, from this logical statement by parsing it. So this, this is essentially a parse tree. Okay. And then we're going to merge the leaf nodes that represent the same variable. So you know, if there are co-references, we're going to merge the nodes. And next, we are going to add connections between quantifiers and the variables they quantify. For example, uh, this is a quantifier for all quantifier, and we add a connection, add a, a link from this quantifier to the variable it quantifies. And so we do the uh, same thing for this uh, exists quantifier. Okay? And then we also drop the original names we have for these variables and just replace the names with this one generic name called variable. Okay? As you can see here, this graph does not depend on how you name the variables originally. Okay? but it preserves the information about the semantics of a quantifier. Okay? For example, we know that this quantifier quantifies this variable, and we know uh, this variable is the first argument with predicates. Right? So we know which quantifier quantifies which variable of which predicates. Right? And this is all that matters in terms of the semantics. So in other words, so by converting this uh, logical statement into a graph, we have achieved invariance to variable naming. But there is no loss of semantic information. So you can go back uh, to th uh, the original formula uh, from this graph. Yes? So for your edge of time, do you order matters instead of logical trees that you, like x comes before y? Okay, so yes. So the ordering of the argument matters, and we preserve such information uh, with the graph. <laughs> right, so, so we, have a, we have an idea of which the ordering of the edge. So, yeah, so that, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's an excellent point. Uh, so in fact, when we try to generate the embedding for this graph, we have a way to preserve the ordering of the edge. Uh, but I, that detail, I, actually, I will uh, not uh, uh, discuss. But, but yeah, but, but uh, the ordering of arguments in the function is, is important. So, uh, a side benefit of this graph representation is that now it makes the synthetic structure explicit in the sense that uh, if two terms are close syntactically, it will be close. You know that. Uh, whereas in a linearized form, right, you, we know that you know, the, the two terms can actually be quite far away. 
uh, when you try to linearize uh, uh, the, the form, uh, this graph into uh, the, the, the sequential representation. So now, given a graph of the formula, we can uh, embed this into a vector. So here, uh, we start with an uh, embedding vector for each node, initial embedding vector for each node. And this embedding vector just, uh, is just the one hot embedding of the token associated with the node. Okay? And then we're going to update the embedding for each node by taking the embeddings of its uh, neighbors and uh, pass them through a neural network. And so we get updated embedding for each node. And we do this for every node. I use the same neural network. And then we do multiple such iterations. And uh, the more iterations will allow you to uh, take into account larger graph structures. And then after multiple iterations, uh, we do max pooling of all the node embeddings uh, into a single vector for the entire graph. Okay. Now, uh, we can convert each formula into a graph and then embed the graph into a vector. Uh, we can do this for both the conjecture and the fact. And then this whole thing now becomes a deep network and then you can train it end to end. If you have uh, ground truth data about uh, conjecture and fact and whether they are relevant or not. So we evaluate this approach using this whole step data set, which is recently introduced for evaluating machine learning methods for theorem proving. So it has ground truth conjecture fact pairs expressed in higher order logic. Most of them are not actually human understandable. Uh, some of them are. Here's one example. So this is a conjecture, uh, a ground truth relevant fact, and the ground truth irrelevant fact. And we show that on this data set, we can outperform prior methods by a very large margin. As the prior methods uh, were based on sequence embedding, which uh, are not invariant variable naming, and it, uh, uh, it, they don't make syntactic uh, the syntactic structure of uh, the logical statements explicit. Okay, so now I'm ready to uh, show you the real title of my talk, which is actually teaching computers to see and think in graphs and embeddings. So in the seeing part, that is pixels to graph, I show how we can extract a graph out of the embeddings. Okay, so in other words, uh, converting a graph from its continuous form to its discrete form. Uh, in the thinking part, uh, I show how we can reason over graphs in the vector space. In other words, how we can uh, put a graph in its discrete form into its continuous form and uh, reason over the graph in the continuous uh, vector space. So uh, essentially we have a synergy be, uh, of ideas from symbolic AI and uh, connection to AI, which I find uh, very exciting. With that, uh, I'd like to conclude my talk by acknowledging my students and sponsors. Without them, this work would not have been possible. Uh, thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions. I'm sorry, uh, could so you... Saying, like, is this a possibility that you, you know, you might be asking something that's not, like, that you're more concerned with the confidence of the uh, model that you're trying to predict? Like, is that the logic? Uh, I, I see. Yeah. So how would you, is your work sort of, like, like that with the setting like that? Okay, so here, um, right, so here the, uh, this uh, th part about theorem proving, uh, is not, it's not, uh, doesn't address uh, uncertainty in, in the sense of, uh, uh, you know, assigning a probability to, to your uh, logical statement. Uh, it's mostly concerned, it's concerned about sort of how do you do search more effectively. But I don't see a, a limitation here in, in, in the sense that 
you know, you can think of your proof as sort of some uh, that comes with uncertainty. Maybe you know, when you apply logical rules, uh, logical rules would be sort of soft, and that you know that that would make the problem more challenging. Uh, uh, but I think uh, you, you, it's possible to ad admit uh, to have probabilistic. Uh, 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 statements here. Yes. Yeah, wonderful talk. I was just a little curious about the um, uh, evaluating for, for relevance, and then I'm wondering whether it handles sort of kind of approaches, approaches of statements. So if you have sort of three propositions, you would, how old is John? John is a Boy Scout. All Boy Scouts are mm -hmm. in their community. Mm -hmm. You can get these things where, there's, where you get massive I see. So uh, this is still on the individual statements level. So it's, um, it doesn't really consider sort of the relationships between statements. Uh, uh, that can also be expressed as a graph. And I think there are interesting questions to ask there. But yeah, so we haven't addressed that. Right. Yes, you're exactly right. So if you only train with the uh, annotations of relative depths, and the uh, the output is essentially is up to a monotonic transformation, any monotonic transformation you can scale it, right? It still satisfies the reordering. Uh, yeah. Right. So you don't actually have a scale uh, that's ambiguous, and you don't have you lose a lot of metric information. So what we do uh, in practice is that we use these uh, relative depth annotations to supplement existing RGBD data. So if you, if you care about metric depth information, uh, you, you can just combine these annotations with uh, existing RGBD data. And also, uh, for surface normals, now you can recover more metric information because surface normals essentially tell you the derivative of uh, depth. So you can recover depths uh, with less ambiguity. There's still scale ambiguity there, for sure, but, but uh, ultimately it depends on what you care about, uh, about your particular application. Yeah, I want to pick your brain a little bit on the uh, opposite side of the supervised methods. Uh, so, you, you know, so actually it was very intriguing the last part of your talk where you look at the relevance between the, the logic statements. As you know, the, there's a never learning uh, algorithm that uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, th I think uh, th this can be applied. Uh, we haven't done it because here the focus is, is on the embedding side. So you know, if you want to do a unsupervised setting, uh, a lot of cases you're just changing the objective function you're trying to learn. Uh, so I think uh, that would be very interesting uh, and, and, and sh could uh, be done uh, in using some of the elements here. So yeah, so embedding vector on the mm. subgraph you have already, and then you then max pool over that and then sort of uh, have one embedding. What if you just keep some of the embedding uh, on the subgraph uh, intact, and then you can have a finer detail on how things are corresponding? Yeah, yeah. We, we, uh, we haven't used the uh, embeddings for the subgraph directly, but we have tried to visualize them. So in fact, you can sort of do retrieval, use the embeddings of the subgraph, and you can see you know, what are the similar graphs that the, uh, the network thinks. Is it in embedding in which dimension it is usually for your setting? Uh, so here it's about 200 dimensions. 200 dimensions. Yeah. And what you visualize, how you visualize it in this space? Well, we, don't, we, just, we just take a, a subgraph and then uh, retrieve the nearest neighbors from the embedding space. 
Yes. Right. Um, for, for example, here, the idea is basically, you know, when you're trying to determine what are, what are the relevant statements, right? So the simplest thing you can do is that, okay, if this conjecture is talking about height, right? So you, you just, you, you want to get all the statements that heights in there. So, so if, you, if you sort of, you don't do any embedding, you don't do any of this iteration, and you just start with the one hot embedding for each node, essentially it's a bag of words. You treat the each formula as a bag of words, you essentially only look at the names of predicates, right, or the names of a constant va uh, variables, right? So, so if once, now if you do embedding, now well, if you do one step, you are li literally looking at sort of the small graphlets. Uh, you're trying to sort of do, uh, uh, detect the patterns of the graph, uh, graphlets and then see if they match together. So, so it's, it's in, a, in an analogy to language, natural language, you're sort of comparing phrases or sort of even longer uh, structures. Okay, the pizza is in a bump space. It's not outside, but in a bump space, so upstairs. All right. So, yeah. So it's, uh, is it your Brompton? Uh, yeah, it's my uh, Thank you, man. That's nice. Yeah. So, I was wondering, you emailed you. I'm kind of. Uh, oh, yeah, talking. yeah, right. I don't know when it's a good time. Or... Actually, today I double booked myself a little bit. Oh, would you mind if you can? Back at uh, like 1.45-ish. I'm on the faculty meeting right now. Oh, okay. Actually, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, 2 o'clock in the Where are you talking to? It's 4.63. Oh, you do? Okay, nice. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's a fascinating, yeah, so I'm, yeah, I think it would be kind of interesting. Uh,